I would you take your Bibles tonight and open, please, to uh, Psalm 88. Psalm 88. I was reading this psalm um, a few mornings ago, and I thought I wanted to bring you something from this. And the title of the sermon tonight is, When Darkness is Your Only Friend. I know that doesn't sound like a very uplifting title. But this is one of the darkest psalms in all the Bible. I don't know if you knew that or not. Psalm 88 is one of those lament psalms. Joe and Mary Lou Bailey were, real life, were a real-life couple that God tested beyond what I think I could ever begin to endure. Let me tell you about them. Joe was in the Lord's work. He was working in a Christian organization with students. He was also writing articles for Christian magazines. He had a happy family. They had three sons and a daughter. Then tragedy struck. Uh, one of their young sons developed leukemia, and he died at the age of five. Joe tells all this in a book that he wrote afterwards. He talked about his son, Danny, who died in his bed with his mother and father next to him, comforting him, loving him, telling him about Jesus and telling him about heaven. This was originally published in the book, The View from a Hearst, and a chapter in it that says the last thing we talked about. Now, they had always spoken to Danny about heaven. They were trying to prepare him for what was may come. And Danny always responded with simple childlike faith, believing all that his parents said. But he said in the book on this particular day, Danny did not want to go to heaven. He said he wanted to stay and be with his mom and his dad and his brothers and sisters. He wanted to be in his own home. He didn't want to leave all that he knew. But he goes on to say, but he did leave and he died that day. Then he writes that God gave them the hope of new life because they were expecting another baby and they rejoiced. But still, when that baby came, that baby was born with a severe handicap, and they named him John. On the second day of John's life, he also died. So the Baileys had lost two children. And it's been said that the most severe trauma that a parent can ever suffer is the death of a child. And statistics show that divorce rates actually skyrocket in families where a child dies, because a lot of times... Uh, The parents are so consumed with their own sorrow and grief, they don't know how to really help or reach out to the other. And yet the Baileys lost two sons, and God wasn't finished with them yet. Um, A few years later, their 18-year-old son, Joe, had kind of a crazy sledding accident. He was a hemophiliac, and he bled to death. Seven years, three sons, three deaths. That is just incredibly beyond my comprehension to be able to deal with that. And Joseph Bailey wrote a prayer after the death of his son, Joe, and this is part of it. This is what he said, quote, Let me alone, Lord. You've taken from me what I should have given your world. I cannot see such waste that you should take what poor men need. You have a heaven full of treasure. Could you not wait to exercise your claim on this? And then he writes this, Oh, spare me, Lord. Forgive that I may see beyond this world, beyond myself, your sovereign plan. Or seeing not, may I trust you still. Have mercy, Lord. That's a very real prayer, isn't it? A very transparent prayer from someone who is going through a a time of darkness that's beyond perhaps what most of us have ever had to endure. And the reason I read that is because it reminds me here of Psalm 88. This is a psalm that was written for bad times. Now, for people that are in spots like um, the Baileys were, there are many psalms that teach us how to praise God in the good times. In fact, half of the book of Psalms was written in, for b- believers to just give praise to God. But there's also another part of these psalms that are actually written to help us in the bad times as well as in the good times. Um, And you'll notice that I'm sure when you read the book of Psalms yourself that it doesn't really hide from the difficult issues. And we certainly see this here. Um, These psalms that are written for the bad times, for the difficult times, are called actually lament psalms. And uh, really, roughly half of the whole book of Psalms are made up of these lament psalms. 
And the typical pattern of a lament psalm goes like this. First of all, the first stage is pain or perplexity. This is where the psalmist will address God and he'll tell God about all of his sorrows, all of his problems, how he's overwhelmed. Then the second part of the psalm is prayer, we could say. This is where the psalmist asks God to hear his prayer. He goes before the Lord and then he thanks God for hearing and for in answering that prayer. And then the last part of the lament psalm normally is a section called praise. And this is where they will begin to praise the Lord. Perhaps there was a, uh, a, a lapse in time. Perhaps there was time between the, the prayer and the praise where the Lord actually did answer and the Lord did bring victory. And so there's a little gap there. But the last part of the psalm, however, is just normally a praise. It, always in the lament psalms, they end on a positive note. That's normally the pattern. So you have pain, then you have prayer, then you have praise. Now, Psalm 88 is classified as a lament psalm, but it's a unique psalm because it doesn't fit the typical pattern. In fact, there's no other psalm in the book of Psalms that's exactly like Psalm 88. You know why? Because it presents such a bleak picture. It, it just ends. There's no praise at the end of Psalm 88. It ends on kind of a depressing note. It ends with a horrible groan. In fact, the last word of the psalm, if you look in verse 18, the last word in verse 18 is the Hebrew word koshek, darkness. There's simply no closing note of triumph, as in other psalms. And what does he speak about in this psalm? Well, he speaks about darkness. Look in verse number 1, where he said, O Lord, God of my salvation, I cried day and night before thee. Verse 2, let my prayer come before thee, incline thine ear unto my cry. Look down at verse number 6. Thou hast laid me in the lowest pit in darkness in the depths. And look down at verse number um, 12. Shall the wonders be known in the dark? And then drop down to verse 18. Lover and friend hast thou put far from me and mine acquaintance into, again, we see the word there, darkness. And so he speaks about Life in darkness, life in the depths. He talks about death being imminent, if you read the psalm closely. He talks about feeling like he's drowning in all of his sorrows in verse 16 and 17. He talks about loneliness or the feeling that he's in prison. Look in verse number 8. Thou hast put away, um, away mine acquaintance far from me. Thou hast made me a, an abomination unto them. I am shut up. I cannot come forth. It's like I'm in a prison. The gate is closed. I can't get out. I'm all shut up. I'm, I'm imprisoned here. And, and again, in, the, in verse 18, it, it, it seems like he's saying, Lord, you've, you've taken away from me all of my friends. And the only real acquaintance that I have is darkness. Darkness is my only friend. That's why I titled this psalm, When Darkness is Your Only Friend. That seems to be what he's saying in verse number 18. Uh, that darkness is the only friend that he has. And notice the subtitle below uh, chapter 88. The subtitle, basically in the Hebrew, Hebrew, Mahalath and uh, uh, Lenoth. Mahalath means sickness. Lenoth means for singing or for humbling. And really, so the, the, this psalm was really a psalm that is referring to a sad song, a somber song, and that's supposed to really humble the person that, that sings it or bring us to bring them low before the Lord. And so to be honest with you, this is just a, a dark psalm. In fact, some commentators say that this is the darkest corner of the book of Psalms. Now, the writer of the book, again, if you look at the subtitle, is a man by the name of Heman. And there's two possibilities. This could be the son of Joel, who was a temple musician during the reign of David. That's probably the most likely candidate. The second choice is Heman, the son of, of, of Mahol, one of the wise men during the reign of King Solomon. He's found in, he's found in 1 Kings 4, 31. Now, so we're not really sure which one it is. Perhaps the first one I mentioned. What we do know is this. He was a servant of God. He was faithful in the house of God. He was called one of the sons of Kohalath, which means he was in the temple. Uh, his ministry was to write music of praise and worship to God. So he was, you could call a full-time servant of the Lord, but he was also a man who was suffering intensely 
And he didn't understand why he was suffering. He didn't understand why he had to be in the darkness that he was in. But the thing we learn about him is that even despite all of the difficulty that he's enduring, he doesn't lose his faith and he does not abandon his faith. He just continues to call out and cry out to God. Now, this, as I said, this psalm doesn't have a happy ending, but not all of life's scripts have happy endings. But that doesn't mean that God has forsaken us. And we have to understand that. So what I want us to do is just look at this psalm, and I want you to see four responses to the darkness that he, that he was facing. And we can apply this in our life, perhaps. Maybe there are some folks here, you're going through a difficult time. Don't raise your hand, but how many of you would, maybe in the, you're in your Christian life and you say, you know, I've prayed about this and I've prayed about it, and prayer doesn't seem to help. It just seems like God hasn't answered. I've asked God to remove this from me, and he hasn't removed it. I don't understand why I'm in this dark and why I'm suffering the way I am. There's a lot of things perhaps you, you're wrestling with. You might be going through a crisis of faith. This is exactly what he's going through, you might say, a bit of a crisis of faith. He's, he's in a time of incredible darkness. And so I want you to see how to respond to the darkness that we might experience that's very real in our own spiritual journey. And four responses here. Here's the, the first one. I call this a spiritual response Go to the Lord by faith. Just go to the Lord by faith. This was very difficult for this psalmist. He felt that death was near, but again, he didn't give up. He still trusted in God. And what I notice about this psalm is that there are four times when he cries out to God and he uses the divine name. Remember what I told you about the divine name. Whenever a person uses that name, and we know it in the King James because it's all in capital letters, Lord is always in, when it's in caps like that, that's always the divine name. And remember I said that in the Old Testament, that name was only used by Orthodox Jews when they were in a life or death crisis and a life or death struggle because that name was so sacred. They didn't utter it any other time. And so, but they would always violate that general rule when they were just absolutely, totally desperate. And what we see here is four times he cries out to the Lord in this psalm. He, he uses the divine name in verse 1. He uses it in verse 9. He uses it in verse 13. And again in verse 14, O oh Lord, O oh Lord. Again, he cries out, O oh Lord. There's another thing that I see here, and that is three times where it says he cried. Three times. And there are three different words used, three different Hebrew words used for crying out. In verse 1, he cries out. Uh, it's a, the word there means a cry for help when you're in great anguish. In verse 2, again, he uses the word cry. Hear my cry. This is a loud shout. And then again in verse 13, he uses the word cry. And here it's a cry of anguish. And so what this tells me is that even in his darkness, you know what he was still doing? He was fervently praying. He believed God could hear his prayers. He believed in a God who could do wonders. We see that in verse number 10 when he talks about Lord showing wonders. Will you show wonders to the dead? So he believed that he served a God that could do wonders, a God who loved him, a God who was faithful to his people. All this is evidence that in his heart, even though he spoke like he was ready to give up, he still didn't give up. He was still calling on the Lord. In verse 1, he was praying day and night. And I would just say this. This is the way we apply this to us tonight. No matter how dark it might be for you, don't stop crying out to the Lord. There's no situation, no matter how impossible our circumstances may seem, where we should Stop depending on the Lord and stop crying out to the Lord. And this is what he's doing. He's going to the Lord. He keeps on praying. Now, you have to remember, he's a high priest. He works in the temple sanctuary. And every day at the temple, they would always close the daily ministry with the priestly benediction. You remember what that was? The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. And so that was a, the blessing that he would hear that every day. But you know what? He didn't feel like he was experiencing blessing. He felt rejected. 
He felt as if God had turned his face from him. He was still in the dark. But you know what? He kept on praying. And he just kept going to the Lord in faith. There's a big lesson from that for all of us. And so we see then a spiritual response. Go to the Lord in faith. Here's the second thing I want you to see, an emotional response. Tell the Lord how you feel. Look at verse number three. For my soul is full of troubles, and my life drawn nigh unto the grave. I am counted with them that go down into the pit. I'm as a man that hath no strength. Free among the dead, like the slain that lie in the grave, whom thou rememberest no more, and they are cut off from thy hand. Thou hast laid me in the lowest pit, in darkness, in the deep. Thy wrath lieth hard upon me. Thou hast afflicted me with all thy waves, Selah. Thou hast put away mine acquaintances far from me. Thou hast made me an abomination unto them. I am shut up, and I cannot come forth. Mine eye mourneth by reason of affliction. Lord, I have called daily upon thee. I have stretched out my hands unto thee. So you see what he's doing here? He's really pouring his heart out to God, isn't he? He's telling God exactly how he feels. You know what? There's no place for hypocrisy in personal prayer. You understand that? You can't fool God. He knows how you feel. You can't go to the Lord and say, oh, well, Lord, I'm trusting you. No, you're not. He knows exactly where you are. He knows your heart. When we're going to the Lord, we need to be absolutely transparent. Notice I didn't say irreverent, but I, I, but I think we should be transparent to God. Once, one person said this, one of the first steps toward revival is to be completely transparent when we pray and not tell the Lord anything that is not true or that we do not really mean. And that's what we see from the psalmist here. He confessed that his life was full of troubles. He said, Lord, I'm living like a dead man. He said, Lord, I, 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 I'm, I'm without strength. He, he told the Lord that he felt like he was forsaken by God. And then he tells God, Lord, you're responsible for these troubles. Notice how he says, Lord, what you have done. Look in verse 8. Thou has put away mine acquaintances far from me. Thou has made me an abomination, and I am shut up. And he, he just says, Lord, look back up to verse 7. Thy wrath lieth hard upon me. Back up to verse 6. Thou hast laid me in the lowest pit. Lord, this is things that you're doing in my life. These are the things that you're allowing to happen. He believed that God was sovereign, that God was in control of his life. And so he's pouring his heart out to God. Lord, this is how I feel. This is what's happening. Did you know that? Some of our best prayers come when we're in the dark. That's when we do our best praying, just pouring our heart out before the Lord. I was reading a, a sermon on this chapter by Spurgeon. And uh, basically in the sermon, one of his points was um, learn how to pray in the dark. Just learn how to pray. And maybe sometimes God will allow us to go through these long seasons of darkness because we still haven't really learned how to pray. And he says that when you're there in the, in the dark, you really learn how to pray. And he said, you know, there's nothing uh, magical about repeating certain phrases or a form of words, which is what we all kind of descend into. You know, we all have our trite ways of just approaching the Lord and saying the same thing over again. And we're really not praying with our heart. We're not really praying with transparency. But he's saying when you're in the dark, you need to really learn how to pray. Let me quote you what he said in his sermon. It's a good thing what he said here. He said, if you would pray aright, you will do wisely to copy the writer of this psalm. And first, tell the Lord your case. In this psalm, Heman makes a map of his life's history. He puts down all the dark places through which he has traveled. He mentions his sins, his sorrows, his hopes, if he had any, his fears, his woes, and so on. Now that is real prayer, laying your case before the Lord. Go to your chamber and shut your door and tell the Lord all about yourself. Do you lack words? Well, then use no words. Tell him all simply by the movements of your thought, for God can read the thoughts of men. Act as if you are, are like Hezekiah or opening a letter and spread it out before the Lord and hide nothing from him. It is true that you cannot hide it, for he knows all about you, but still do not try to conceal anything from your God. Tell him about your life of sin. Tell him of your vain attempts to make yourself better. Tell him of your many failures. Tell him of your false hopes. 
Tell them of all your blunders and mistakes and then say, Lord, I do not even know how fully to understand my own case, but thou dost. Do with me according to thy own wisdom and prudence and save thy servant, I beseech thee. That's pretty good advice, isn't it? Just go to the Lord, be transparent, tell the Lord how you feel. That's what the psalmist does here. But then there's a third thing. A spiritual response, go to the Lord by faith. An emotional response, tell the Lord how you feel. And then I call this a logical response. Defend your case before the Lord. Present your case. And this is what he does here. I think his, his argument is pretty sound. He uses good logic. And what does he say? Look down in verse number 10. Will thou show wonders to the dead? Shall the dead arise and praise thee? Shall, the lo- shall thy loving kindness be declared in the grave or thy faithfulness in destruction? Shall thy wonders be known in the dark and thy righteousness in the land of forgetfulness? In essence, what's the argument that he's using here? God, how can I serve you if I'm dead? How can I help you if I'm, I'm in the grave? I can't praise you out of the grave. I can't serve you when I'm in the grave. And so, Lord, heal me, help me. I think really when you read this, it may be some sickness that he's been dealing with all of his life. And he's on the verge of death. And evidently, this is so bad that all of his friends walked away from him. And he's by himself now. And he's saying, Lord, if if I'm in the grave, I can't praise you. This was a guy that was, his ministry was to write songs and lead people in worship. And he said, Lord, how can I do that if I am in in, in the grave, if I'm dead? So, Lord, heal me. You ever do that? You ever say, you ever lay out your case before the... God, and I think what we see here is just laying it out logically as a lawyer. I've done that in prayer. I would say something like, Lord, how can I serve you if, if you don't do this for me? How can, you, how, how can I serve you? I, I can't do this on my own. Lord, and I would give reasons why I need you right now, Lord, to do this for me. And that's what he's doing here. The minister Samuel Rutherford, the Scottish minister, he said one time this. He said, it's faith work to claim loving kindnesses out of the roughest strokes of God. That's what faith does. Faith goes and lays your case before the Lord and claims the mercy and the loving kindness that, that you need. And this is, by the way, it's a good thing to do. You, if you don't do it, it might be something to consider. It's just write out your prayers. Maybe write them out in a journal, logically. Think through what you're saying and lay it out before the Lord. Tell God how you feel. But then here's the fourth thing. Go, tell, go, go to the Lord by faith. Tell him how you feel. Defend your cause before the Lord. But I see a fourth thing. And this is what I call a practical response. And this is the hard part. You ready for this? Wait for the Lord's answer. Wait for the Lord's answer. And again, that's the hard part. As I read this, I see a man who's been in a trial for a long time. I mean, it's, this wasn't just something that happened last week. Look at verse 15 when he says, I am afflicted and ready to die from my youth up. While I suffer thy tears, I am distracted. So you get the sense that he's been praying about this thing, whatever he's dealing with for a long time. He says, from my youth up. In verse 17, he says, my afflictions, they come daily. Look at verse 17. They they came round about me daily like water. They come past me about together. So he suffered all his life long, all day long. He couldn't look back to a time in his life when he enjoyed good health. He said, the billows have almost drowned me in verse 7. They fiery waves of torment, he calls them, uh, in verse 16. They went over him. The flood was kind of rising. And again, he says, darkness was his friend, um, was the only friend he had. And so what he's doing is he's waiting God. When, when, Lord, I'm waiting for you. And I'll tell you, to be honest with you, beloved, there are times when we're just going to have to wait for God. We're going to have to wait for his answer. But remember that in the time of waiting, he doesn't forget us. And he gives us grace to deal with what we're going through. And one day we'll look back and we'll see that, you know what? God did take care of that. He didn't do it the day after my prayer or maybe the week after or maybe a few months after or maybe a few years after. And they've taken time for God to give us what we want. Um, not too long ago, one of my old journals 
appeared um, just outside my door where the ladies normally leave mail for me. It seems like in all the shuffling and moving around from office to office, I, one of my journals got lost and um, someone found it and they, they put it on my, uh, in, my, in my things so I could find it. And it was a journal from back in 2002. And uh, I just started to read it. You know, it was one of those mornings I came in the office. There was an old journal. I just opened it up. I started to read through it from 17 years ago. And you know what I found in that journal? There were prayers that I prayed out of desperation. <laughs> Difficulties I was in at that moment while I was crying out to God. I, you could say I, I felt like in a way I was by myself. I was kind of forsaken, a heavy load. There were certain things that I was asking God to do, praying fervently for the Lord to hear me and for the Lord to answer. And you know what I found out? That looking back on it now, 17 years removed from some of those things I had prayed about, looking back, you know what I found out? God took care of all of it. He took care of all of it. Now, it took a while. For some of those things, it took years. But to be honest with you, looking back, even the prayers that I prayed that I wrote down in the journal, I wasn't ready for it at that moment. I could see that now. I wasn't ready for the answer then. And it wasn't the right thing at that moment. But as I look back now on it, you know what I can say? The Lord does all things well. He did it exactly the right way. And I'm grateful to him that I can look back 17 years later and see that he did answer all of those things. And you know what? Not only did he answer those things, he gave me more than I asked for, more than I dreamed for looking back on it. But you know what? It took time. It took time. I had to learn to wait. And I tell you, beloved, waiting faith is the hardest kind of faith in the Christian life, I believe. But we need to learn to wait for God's answer. Ask him to help you trust him. Even when you can't see the big picture, even when it seems like your prayers are not being heard, that prayer is doing no good. I assure you it is doing good. Trust him, wait on him, just like this psalmist here did. And so go to the Lord by faith. Tell the Lord how you feel. De defend your cause before the Lord. Wait for an answer. Just trust God and wait for an answer. And you know what? He will answer you. Let's bow for prayer tonight. Let's bow for prayer. With heads bowed and eyes closed, before I have Reverend Gorham come and lead us in our final song, what I want to do is this. I want to just take a moment. I want you, maybe you're here tonight, and you can say, you know what, I'm kind of going through this crisis this dark period. And I'm kind of like this psalmist. I feel, in a way, I feel forsaken. I feel like I'm at the end of my strength. I feel like my life is full of troubles. Like I've got one foot in the grave. That's the way the psalmist described himself. He's kind of living like a man ready to go into the grave. And you just need the help of God. Would you, would you do this? Would you go to the Lord right now, right there where you're praying? Just go to the Lord. And would you just tell the Lord how you feel? Just lay it out before him. Just tell him. Be honest with him. And defend your cause. Tell him why you need what you need. Just tell him that. And then you know what? Are you willing to wait on him? Just tell him that, Lord, I'm willing to wait. Help me to wait on you and to trust you in this. Because I believe I can trust you. So, Father, we just 
and lay before you these things. Lord, just be with your people. Those that are bringing things to you even now. Give us the faith to just wait on you, Lord, to trust you. To never let go. Never stop trusting you. Even when we can't see the big picture. To trust you, Lord. To know that you know what you're doing. Bless and give grace to your people, Father, as only you can. And we pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen.